Morning, 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 everybody. How are you? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I'm Sean Butler. Maxim Lone's up in front on Squirrel Watch. How you doing? I hope you're happy and healthy doing the things you love. Please do me a favour, guys. Hit the like button for me on the video if you enjoy the content. Hit the subscribe on the channel if you haven't already. Join the 17,100 Tottenham fans that have gone before. Not necessarily Tottenham fans. I misspoke. But presumably most of them are. Hit the notification bell as well. And drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts on today's topic. And guys, I guess we have to talk a little bit about our youth team. After yesterday's surprise announcement that we had signed Luka Vaskovic from Hajduk Split. I was corrected in my video yesterday about the actual name, how to pronounce the names of uh, the team over there. Hajduk Split, I think it's called. Um, 16 years old, six foot four inches tall. Last year when he was 15, he was described by some big, big names in football as the world's greatest 15 year old footballer, the world's best, which is, you know, massive superlatives. It's exciting. The details of the deal hadn't really emerged by the time I put the video out, but they are now. It turns out, I think we ended up paying 12 million euros which is about the same as what PSG and Manchester City had bid back in March or February. And we apparently offended off competition from some of the world's biggest or Europeans' biggest names in football, which leads you to wonder, you know, what was it that gave Tottenham the, the edge? And I, I guess it probably comes down to one of maybe three things. It could either be the, the deal structure, it's in payment terms, or how long do they get to keep him before he comes over. And on that basis, it turns out that we're not gonna see him until he's 18, which means January 2025, I think. So it's about 18 months away, which I haven't got a problem with anyway. It doesn't really matter how good he is or how prepared he is as a footballer. I think when you're 16, you know, you can, it's a very important developmental period of your life. And I think having that kind of family nucleus around you and as many of the invariables that can stay as constant as possible probably removes some of the volatility and the, and the likelihood of, you know, players sort of falling off in those crucial years. And so staying at home, staying with his friends and family, you know, continuing to grow up a little bit as a human, because he is still a child, is probably very smart. I don't know what that would mean though for the length of the contract that we've signed. I don't know, and forgive me for my ignorance here, but if there are limits on youth term, youth team contracts, I mean, the reason we could sign him anyway outside of the window apparently is because he is, he'd be going into the youth setup and so it doesn't count in the same way that the transfer window rules usually do. Well, that's as far as I've heard. I'm not, I'm not convinced that that is necessarily the entire truth to it, but anyway. Um, but so he's staying until he's 18, which is fine. You know, there's plenty of strong competition in the youth system anyway, with Ash Phillips and Dorrington that are just absolutely killing it for their age in that age group. And obviously Ash Phillips is now training with the first team. So he's probably seen as a prior promotion or a priority ahead of Dorrington, but Dorrington is also looking like he's too advanced for the under 21s. We'll talk about the under 21s in a second. Um, so I don't know if, if the reason why uh, the player Vaskovic chose Tottenham over, over others was because of just the deal structure that the Hydric split preferred, or whether it was because of recommendations from maybe ex-pros that are Croatian that have played for Tottenham, like Luka Modric, Niko Krančar, Korluka. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe they had some sort of say or sway and said that Tottenham is a great place to launch your career from. You know, they're, they're kind of youth-centered at the moment, at least it looks and appears to be that that's the direction we've gone in. And that, you know, they're also a good club with good bases and good grounding and the best facilities and all that stuff. So Tottenham makes sense. Maybe it's from people that are still at the club, like Ivan Perisic, 
who is seen as a father figure amongst Croatian players because of his experience. Maybe he is sitting there saying, actually, Tottenham would be a great place for you to come and show off your talents. It might even be Mila Jedinic, who um, I think is also... Am I right? Am I right in saying this? I could be in the mud here. Is he? I think he's Croatian, right? Um, so there's lots of potential reasons or rationales as to why he chose us over City or Chelsea, you know, or Pitt Paris Saint Germain, and it fills you with confidence that Tottenham suddenly are able to compete with the biggest clubs for these youth players as an attractive option. Does it help Tottenham in the short term? No. Obviously, we're not going to see the benefits of this guy for 18 months. And by then, the guy could be nine foot tall and be completely unsuitable for football. <laughs> you know, he put on an inch in the two months between uh, yesterday's announcement when he was announced as six foot four and an article that I read that was written in May or June where he was six foot two and a half or six foot three. So... You know, it's all very well being a strapping tall player that's head and shoulders above your teammates physically at the under-16 level. But how tall is too tall? You know, you try and look around the kind of Premier League at the tallest players. You've got Fraser Foster, who's I think 6'7", he's a goalkeeper. Dan Byrne, I think he's pretty tall. Wout Weghorst, very tall. There's a few of them, right, that are 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, Peter Crouch is obviously about the same. You don't really get too many people that are too much taller than that if ever, in playing, you know, playing soccer, playing football. And, you know, generally speaking, not that it's a, um, a rule, but there is sort of general principles that at certain heights, there starts to be, the benefits start to be outweighed by the, the costs, the physical strain on the, on the body, the additional weight on the joints and things. You do see people that are abnormally tall have lots of issues um, with with their on the injury list and stuff so let's hope that he doesn't grow too much taller otherwise we could be facing a problem but anyway I digress it's very exciting to think that we can compete and when you look at our youth team at the moment Tottenham's under 21 team is first in the league we've played four we've won four we've beaten Manchester City 5-0 away from home I think we beat Newcastle 3-1 uh, Blackburn under 21s and I want to say Derby could be wrong I'll put the, sheet, the results up so you can see it yeah top of the league undefeated I think we've scored 15 goals and only conceded one in four games I mean really impressive stuff against all of the teams that have traditionally been the teams that produce these young hot shots loan them out sell them with uh, sell-on clauses attached. You know, Manchester City have created an incredible model where they end up with the best team in the world in their first team and at the moment don't really ever seem to spend ridiculous amounts of money net-net because of the work that their system and setup provide them on the long end of the curve by implementing successful youth systems. And it just looks to me like that's what Tottenham are doing with... You know, our scouting system, Gavinini looks like he's coming in and just having real impact. Paratici was playing the long game. Obviously, he got caught out with some of the things that were happening from years ago. And you know what? I think he's still very much involved. And every day when you see something, some, of, some of this sort of information kind of fall through or pull through, I feel like I'm actually more willing to let the clock run down on his ban and possibly rehire him. Or if he doesn't want to, or if that's too, too much of a blemish against his name, then keep him in the consulting role, but let him be very instrumental in the hiring of the next director of football so that they can work in tandem together and the actual director of football, you know, not have any of those kind of... Um, those issues with with regards who's really pulling the strings. It'd be nice to see a partnership that can emerge once Scott Munn obviously comes in as well. Time will tell. But yeah, you look at our team, our youth team guys, and you've got 
you know, Jamie Donnelly, Dorrington, Lancashire, Sunsot Bell. This left winger, Yago Santiago, who looks really, really impressive at that level. You got the Sayers boy, the Craig twins. You know, I don't know how many of these guys are gonna make it at Tottenham, how much time they will be offered in the first team. Because unfortunately, or fortunately, I think fortunately more than unfortunately, maybe unfortunately for them, but fortunately for us, our first team also has an incredibly young centre to it, a young average age. You look at, I mean, Destiny Udoggy. I don't think you're going to find two better left backs in the Premier League at the moment, and he's technically still capable of playing in the under 21s. Pape Sar, another player who has come on leaps and bounds and looks like he could be the real deal. He's still figuring it out and growing and learning, but at his age, what he's, what he's achieving and how comfortable he looks and confident he looks, he looks like the real deal. You know, even players like Pedro Porro, who you assume because of where they've come from and what they've achieved, that they're more senior than they are. Dejan Kulosevsky seems to have been around a long time. They're 23, 24 years old. Romero, 24 years old. Van der Ven, 23 years old. You know, Manuel Solomon's young. We, we've got young players throughout the squad. We've only got a couple of kind of older heads in there. And when I say older, I mean, obviously, Hyung Min's son is probably the, uh, the oldest at 30. But apart from that, you know, James Madison and Bissouma, and are we calling them old because they're 27, just because they happen to be two or three years older than the average age of the first team? Not at all. They're reaching their peak. They haven't even reached their peak yet. And so, to me... Tottenham's first team that is doing so many wonderful things this year and that has that youth kind of centric perspective where they're enjoying their football they're, they're, they're willing to take risks yes there'll be mistakes but they're not they're not of an age where they're um, incapable of taking on new instruction learning new things dialing into new energies or, or systems or requests requirements from the, from the new coaches it's beautiful to see and then behind it you have this ecosystem of youth I always remind people of Johnny and Dave who came on my show and they sent a shiver down my spine as cringy as it sounds when they were talking about Tottenham's class of 92 and that might sound a little bit like of a superlative or hyperbolic but um, Manchester United's team that were that graduated at six players I think it was um, Nicky Butt, Paul Scholes, David Beckham, the Neville brothers, Ryan Giggs in there as well. I forget. There was, you know, six or seven players that all came out and and just joined into the first team, and then they went on that ridiculous run of winning nine, what was it, was eight or nine Premier Leagues in twelve or thirteen years or something. To me, it was a. It's going to be difficult to to, to recreate anything like that, but Tottenham might just have been quietly going about their business over the last three years under Paratici, changing the system, changing the focus, trying to identify, recoup, recruit the best young talent around. And if it requires the selling club to have those players back for a year in order to feel okay about the, the transaction, then so be it. So be it with this kid. I think it's the right thing to do anyway. Bringing someone over at 16 could unsettle him too much, as I've already mentioned. But to let him stay there until he's 18, we did the same thing with Pape Sar, and look what the benefits have shown. Look what that has yielded. That patience has yielded so much. With Destiny Udoggy, he stayed in Uda Daisy for a year, killed it. We were all so much looking forward to him, but at the same time almost forgot that he was arriving, and he is a new signing. We don't really know where to factor him into which transfer window. He was technically signed in the last summer's window, but we didn't see him. Do you count him in this window? I don't know. But in any event, he might be in a black hole of where you allocate the credit. But ultimately, on the pitch, he looks absolutely sensational. The other players we're buying, Brennan Johnson. There's another name that we just brought in. He's a youngster. He's an absolute youngster with so much potential. Tottenham could just have the recipe here for long, sustained success. I'm not changing my... my expectations on the season it's going to be difficult if Tottenham beat Sheffield United comfortably beat a low block team comfortably on Saturday and then also go and get a result against Arsenal and then beat Liverpool it's going to be difficult for Tottenham fans to not suddenly look up the table and reset expectations but I'd urge people to remember what we expected out of Ange Postacoglu in the first year 
and even then when you compound on the basic expectations that the that the the, the pre-season was so disrupted by one game being called off to a monsoon another game having to be fulfilled by you know some semi-pro players essentially because of Roma's inability to turn up like so much disruption to our pre-season to have hit the ground running the way we have and then when you look through the youth and the first team and see so much potential so much exciting options that are coming through you can't help but think that the immediate short term looks bright looks exciting but we should temper our expectations just to give everyone the, the chance for it to filter through and the and the the tactics to sink in and, and for Angie's model to be fully understood and digested before we start to really you know hold people accountable for mistakes or anything like that but the medium and long-term future equally looks incredibly bright incredibly bright not all of these players are going to make it not necessarily at Tottenham some of them aren't going to get the chance because there's just too much talent ahead of them that have got too much time on their sides but maybe we could also look at these some of these players in the way that Manchester City look at some of theirs over the years and that is loan them out sell them on put in the sell-on clauses and if some of these players do make it to the standards that we think that they could but just not at Tottenham then that at least gives you the ability to to still manage your FFP to still be able to then go out and and fill the holes where you need with immediate signings in the future but balance all that net spend out with the profits of sell-ons from players that you sold that didn't quite have the opportunity at Tottenham there's really nothing in my opinion to be unhappy about with the way that the youth model is is being carved, sculpted right now. It looks to me like it's there is a plan with it. And maybe it's a plan that we haven't really been paying attention to because we've been struggling to get past the, the awful experience of what was in front of our eyes for the last two, three years since Pochettino. But in the background, Paratici maybe has been taking that long view and those fruits are starting to yield. We'll see. Maybe I'm being a little bit getting ahead of myself, but I, I just think it's worth remembering that there is the immediacy and there's the future. You have to be always juggling both spinning plates around, figuring out the best way to, to create success on the pitch in the short term, and we haven't been good enough at that in the past, in the relative recent past, and until right now, it's not been good enough. But there, are, seems, there seems to be the wheels turning and the cogs moving in the right direction for what's happening there and as we look towards the youth that can sustain and build us for a healthy future. I'm excited. Love to know your thoughts though, guys. Who of who all of the players that are coming through, the Ash Phillips, the Dorringtons, the goalkeeper, Gunter, you know, who of all these players that are coming through do you look at and think is probably going to be the next people that could be knocking on the door of the first team? Santiago, we haven't really spoken much about him. And on that note, by the way, I feel like it's only necessary if I'm going to be taking this this vision and, and this approach where I'm excited about the future, then I should be spending more time talking about what's happening in the present with regards to the players of the future. And so you'll be seeing, I hope to do watch alongs to the under 21 games and certainly scout reports and youth team reports coming up very soon. So keep an eye out for that, guys. I think Tottenham are playing Colchester. Tottenham under 21s are playing Colchester on Friday night in the Vans Trophy. So you might just see me doing a watch along then. But let me know your thoughts either way, guys. How excited are you? Am I getting over the top am I one foot in front of the other or am I walking before I'm crawling with regards to my expectations and optimism about what's happening at Club Tottenham Hotspur like subscribe and comment and as always bye bye